Well, we're going to talk about everyone had an opportunity to go by and, and look at Tom and look at the volatility of the various products. What I'm going to focus on today is some of the large plot research that we've been conducting here at the station and we're going to focus really in on what we did in 2017 and then talk about some other data that's out there. I'm going to talk about primary drift and secondary drift. And when I say primary drift, I'm really talking about physical movement, the movement that's going to occur within a few minutes of you making an application. And physical drift is really a function of wind speed and wind direction. We also have secondary movement. And with secondary movement, that is generally mainly composed of volatility. There's some other forms of secondary movement. You're going to talk, and one of my, or one of my PhD students, just for a second, is going to talk to you about dust and the potential of a product such as dicamba to move in dust. That would be secondary movement. With dicamba, the TTI nozzle that we have, we actually made the application to this field. What we have is we're standing in the middle of a 20 acre field and we sprayed three and a half acres in the center of this field. And you see we did a pretty good job of spraying it and killing the soybeans where we sprayed. This is Extendamax, 22 ounces of Extendamax, a labeled application. If you look to my far left, which is going to be the west side of the farm, you're seeing another 20 acres over there that was sprayed with Ingenia at the simulta simultaneously. This is a 40 acre trial. Dr. Steckel is with us. Dr. Steckel is also doing one over in Tennessee. What we did is we had two mud masters that were running simultaneously. We were at a 30 inch height because our soybeans were six inches tall. That mud master is set at 30 inches. That's where the boom was at the time when we made the application. So we came into the field, we sprayed this field and we sprayed the other field at the same exact time. There's no differences in wind speed, no differences in environmental conditions between these two fields. Now I wanna talk about the setup that we had out here. The mud master that we used is an eight row sprayer and we sprayed this at nine miles per hour. We sprayed 10 gallons per acre and we sprayed this with a TTI 11003. That is a labeled nozzle. That is a labeled application. The other thing that I will tell you is during the time of application out here, the average wind speed was 2.9 miles per hour. 2.9 and we had a maximum wind speed, we had a gust of seven miles per hour. I had a weather station sitting right where you're parked down there with a trailer. We had a weather station out here that was recording the average wind speed, the maximum wind speed. It was recording air temp, soil temp. It was recording humidity. It was recording, what else was it recording? It recorded a lot of things. We had plenty of environmental data. It also had wind direction. We knew which way the wind was coming from. I will actually show you the data associated with that in a moment. So we made that application on July the 20th, starting at 11.56. 11.56, the sprayer started rolling through the field and that spray application stopped at 12.19. So basically we were making a noon application of dicamba at a 2.9 mile per hour wind coming out of the due west. It was directly out of the west. If I'm spraying in a 2.9 mile per hour wind out of the west, which direction is my drift going to occur? That direction to the east. You can turn and you can look to the east and you can see the cupping that you have on this soybean. Okay, that is damage that is potentially coming from physical drift. Labeled application. Also what we had is during the application, if everyone looks across here, you see these red flags. This center three plants right adjacent to the red flags, we had a bucket, a five gallon bucket sitting over V2, V3 soybeans and it remained there for 30 minutes after application. Now question is, am I able to get physical drift on a plant that is under a bucket? I shouldn't be able to. Okay, now the other thing we need to realize, I'll tell you this, we had the at time and application, we had 93 to 94 degrees Fahrenheit. There was some data that Bob Wolf produced that shows 
that a fine droplet, a fine droplet can evaporate at 90 degrees Fahrenheit, and I think it was 35% humidity, a fine is going to evaporate within nine inches of leaving a sprayer. Do you have potentially have fines with a TTI nozzle? I have a graduate student that actually did work with Ingenia, Liberty, other products, and what we've seen is the TTI 11003 is going to produce approximately 1% fines. So there is the possibility that we had fines that evaporated prior to hitting the soil surface, and with that, they would have a very, very low settling velocity, because all you've got now is an evaporated spray molecule, a molecule that's in the air that is settling at a very slow rate. So we had that, and you see the damage that you've got here, and I'm gonna look closer at that in a second. But at 12 days after application, we came in here last week, and we marked the periphery. This is what was sprayed in Genia and Extendamax, three and a half acres. We marked the periphery of where we saw 5% damage. There was damage beyond that, but we've also got a little bit of dicamba out here on some of these beans. So we marked the 5% periphery at 12 days after application. Today, we are 19 days out. What we saw was we had 4.66 acres that were damaged from Ingenia, and we had 5.26 acres that were damaged from Extendamax. That's what the data says after spraying three and a half acres. During the application, that 2.9 mile per hour wind was blowing out of the west, and it blew out of the west for zero to six hours. I'm actually going to show you some data on that in a second from the weather station. But it was blowing almost due west for zero to six hours. What we had at that afternoon at 6.30, the wind shifted and came out of the south. If the wind's shifting coming out of the south, it should be blowing towards the north side of the field. I want everyone to turn around, and I know it's crowded here, you may not be able to see, but I want you to look to the north side, north and north, back towards the northwest. Do you see damage to those beams? This is what you're seeing here. I'm pointing right here. This is the damage on the north side of both of these fields. The wind shifted and it blew from, from out for six hours, from six hours out to 20 hours, it blew from the south. Then it shifted back and blew from 20 to 24 hours. From that time frame, it blew back out of the southwest. From zero to 72 hours, we had wind that was either blowing out of the south or the west. We had no other wind direction out here. Now I want you to look these other sides. We have no very little damage here because the wind was never blowing in that direction. We had no opportunity to move a product. The other point to make here is at 12 days, Ingenia moved 302 feet, Extendamax moved 303 feet. The current label says a buffer, and I know Arkansas had a quarter of a mile downwind buffer. The current label says a buffer of 110 feet. That white flag, if you look directly behind you, there's a white bicycle flag right out here, right, right, right behind you. You see it? Right here, it's just about 50 feet north of this flag line. That white flag is at 110 feet. We had damage well beyond 110 feet, and I'll show you that in a moment. If you look at the label, if you look at the label, there would not be a buffer. Granted, Arkansas had a 100-foot buffer on the other three sides. There would not be a buffer on the other three sides of the field based on the labels that are out there today. But we're going to look, we'll look at that and look at some of the movement that we saw. Next slide. So here's the wind data. This is the actual data. So from zero to six hours, the wind was blowing almost directly out of the west. 270 degrees would be west, blowing out of the west. You see at 6.30, right in here, about 6.30, the wind shifted and started blowing out of the south, south-southwest. And it did that out until about 9.30, 9 o'clock, 9.30 the next day, at which it shifted and came back out of the west again. So the wind was blowing in this direction from zero to six. It shifted and then started blowing due north almost from six hours out to 20 hours after application. Next slide. 
But what about temperature? If we look at the volatility of a product, the volatility of any product is a function of temperature. Air temperature, soil temperature. Now question, which is going to be warmer, the air temperature or the soil temperature out here? When we started spraying, we were at 93 to 94 degrees when we started spraying at noon on the 20th. We had a maximum temperature that day of about 97 to 98 degrees. We had a minimum temperature over the next three days, we had a minimum temperature of about 75, 77 degrees, depending on which day you are. This is the actual air temperature that we're monitoring. We experienced almost every day, we experienced a 97, 98 degree temp for the three days, the three days after we sprayed. But here's soil temp. Material hits the soil surface. By the second day, by the second day, a little over 24 hours after application, we had a soil temp of right at almost 113 degrees Fahrenheit. We had that again the following day. The soil temperature rarely, rarely got beneath 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And that was a soil temp at a half an inch depth is where we were measuring that. That's not laying on the soil surface, the soil probe. We had it at about a half an inch depth right here on the corner of the field. Next slide. So how far did it move? What happened along this transect? And I'm only looking at the north. There's four transects that we put on the west side, on the east side of this field. If we look, if we look at what we have here, not here what was under the bucket. I had this bucket here on this plant, but what we didn't have under the bucket if I look at that, that's a combination of primary and secondary movement, or we could say physical drift, volatility, and other factors associated with that. The yellow line, this is for Extendamax. We started out at 45% damage, about 10 feet in, and if you go out here to the buffer, the 110, just looking at a 110 foot buffer, we're at about 25% damage 12 days after treatment. If we look at secondary, what was under the bucket, along that transect. If we look at that, we started out with 30% damage and at 12 days after application, 110 feet out, we're about at 10% damage. This is with Extendamax, so it definitely went beyond, that is in a 2.9 mile per hour average wind during application. Next slide, what about Ingenia? Ingenia was slightly, slightly better. It's pretty slight, but if you take a look, as these fall off, they start out about the same place. By the time we get out to 110 feet, we're at 18% with Ingenia for the primary and secondary combined. If we look at just the secondary movement, which would mainly be volatility out here, we're talking about, we're talking about 8% damage. And you can see that it went, actually the corner of the field, we've got 5% damage on the corner of the field there at 220 feet. Next slide. Now, before we get to this, in it, so in addition to spraying that and having movement in this direction and looking at what potentially is gassing off of this or causing some of this secondary movement, when we sprayed this, I had plants that I brought in here from Fayetteville and they're actually on the table behind, table behind the folks there, the white table. If you take a look at those plants, what you're going to see is considerable damage to plants that were brought and set in these fields. Look at the white flags. Where those white flags are, we took trays, plastic trays, set them in the field, and we introduced two soybean plants at each of those white flags. So we had 20 soybean plants that were placed in the center of this field, three and a half acres sprayed. We had 20 plants that were sprayed in, placed in there half an hour after application and we kept those in there out to 36 hours. Folks, that should not be physical drift. That should be experiencing any damage to those soybeans should be what is coming off of the soil here. In addition to that, we took plants and brought them to the field 24 hours after application. At 24 hours, we introduced 20 plants in the center of this field. I cannot tell the difference, we rated these and there is considerable damage, you can go over there and look at this, whether it be Ingenia or whether it be Extendamax, there is considerable damage to those plants and what really is interesting to me is 
whether the plants were placed out here at a half an hour or we placed these plants out here at 24 hours after spraying, the amount of damage that we saw to those plants is pretty comparable. We still had a tremendous amount of material that was coming off of this field 24 hours after application based on what you see to those plants. And everyone can come by, you can take a look at those plants, just don't take them with you. Um, you can take a picture of them, that's what they're there to see is the, uh, the plants that we have. In addition to that, we came and about a month, month and a half earlier, we came out and we sprayed a similar study, but we did it with two acres rather than three and a half acres. And we sprayed it in another field that we had planted dicamba soybeans. And after making that application, 30 minutes after application, which half an hour after application, we took Ingenia, the Ingenia sprayed on two acres, and we took the premix of Metolachlor plus Extendamax, this would be Syngenta's premix, and we brought those and placed those in the field a half an hour after application, and we left those in the field out until 24 hours after application. So we're at 23 and a half hours of exposure of what's coming off of that field. This is the amount of damage that we saw with Ingenia, and this is the amount of damage that we saw with the premix. That photograph was taken in my greenhouse. I brought these plants back to Fayetteville, and at 21 days after making the application out here, we rated these, and we actually took photographs. And what I see for the most part is, the amount of damage, and you can see it here, the amount of damage that we saw from these two were pretty comparable. There really wasn't a lot of difference in that. Well, the common question that we get is, well, have we looked at these products before? We have not, we were not allowed to test Extendamax, and this is, Arkansas State Plant Board has asked the question, we weren't allowed to test Extendamax prior to it being commercially launched. So no, we did not have any data on Extendamax prior to this. In the field that we're sitting, we have, are standing, we have actually tested Ingenia for the last two years. And it was somewhat similar to what we did this year, except we sprayed a third of an acre rather than a 3.5 acres. What we did the past couple of years is we had eight transects. And if you look closely at this slide, you can see the eight, these are eight cardinal directions that we moved. We sprayed a labeled application of Ingenia a non-labeled application, what eventually would be a non-labeled application of clarity, and we looked at the distance moved. One thing is for certain that I have learned here in doing this work, the distance this moves really is a function of how much area that you spray. The more you spray, the more it's going to move because it's basically it's a matter of loading a given area with a particular herbicide. Next slide. So when we come back and we look at the 2016 data, and this is the data that has been presented to the Arkansas State Plant Board. We had buckets in the field, similar to what we have here. These are buckets that were removed 30 minutes after application. We have Clarity and we have Ingenia. Yellow is Clarity, white is Ingenia. So we had a comparable response out to hitting about the 110 foot buffer and then beyond that point, we were still able to pick up, we were able to pick up clarity damage out to about 439 feet, or 439 feet was the first time we didn't see damage. 399 or 400 feet was where we saw damage. Whereas with Ingenia, we did not see damage beyond 208 feet. So based on that, the Arkansas State Plant Board allowed the use of Ingenia in Arkansas in 20. 17. Now what I have said all along was we did see secondary movement. We had secondary movement. We had buckets that were covered. Those buckets were removed 30 minutes after application and yes both of these products did move. 2015 we conducted a trial out here. We did see some movement. We did not see a lot. 2015, the problem we ran into was we made an application. There was no chance of rain for the next three days. Six hours later, we had three quarters of an inch of rain that fell. And with that, we had very little movement of the herbicide because it has a very low KOC. It does not bind well to soil. You get water on it, and you're going to begin to push that herbicide into the soil, and you're not going to have a lot of secondary movement. 
Is this the first time we've seen anything like this? Larry is here, his colleague over in Tennessee. Dr. Tom Mueller gave me permission to use this. Tom Mueller has some comparable data. My understanding is Tom sprayed an area out in the middle of the field, probably not this size, but he sprayed a sizable area out in the middle of the field. He set in the field, he set detectors in there that could measure the concentration of dicamba in the air. And he looked at Ingenia plus Roundup Power Max and Ingenia by itself. And what this data says is he looked at it out to 36 hours after application and Tom Mueller was able to detect dicamba in the air out to his final data point, 36 hours. If he tested it beyond, he may or may not found it, but at least his last sampling point, he found dicamba at 36 hours after application, there was still dicamba that was coming off of the ground, coming off of his target, and he was detecting in the air. Well, is there other data out there? This is data from Kevin Bradley, our colleague up in, the, uh, in Missouri. Kevin put out a study recently where he sprayed Banville. He sprayed Ingenia, the black bar. He sprayed Extendamax. And he went back in with air samplers with puffers and measured the concentration of dicamba. I'm pretty certain he sprayed this early in the morning and he's it's from zero to two hours. You see, he had numerically, he had more dicamba that he measured from Banville but you did still have volatility of Ingenia and you had Extendamax. From two to five hours, he still had more dicamba coming off of the Banville. Now this is what I find is interesting. Once things started heating up, five to eight hours after application, the Banville now numerically is less than the other two and now he's finding more Ingenia and he's finding more Extendamax that's coming off at that time point. He looks at it from 8 to 16 hours. I would assume the conditions would probably getting cooler at this point because he's moving into nightfall. He did find some dicamba here. He didn't find any actually in Genia, but he did find it, but it was extremely slight. And he is still running the samples. He's, not, he's got data out to 72 hours, but he's still trying to run those samples at this point. So what we know is, based on what we've seen here, Based on what we saw in Tennessee, based on what we saw in Missouri, we know at least out to 36 hours, we have material that is coming off of these, these treated areas. Now what does that mean? What that means is when you go out and you spray this field, and if you look at the labels, the labels were the labeled application was made to this field. What that means is you can actually spray a field correctly and you can make an application at noon, noon on July the 20th. You can also then have a potential inversion that can set in the next day or set in the following day and if that material volatilizes off of that soil surface and then gets hung in this inversion it has the potential to move and it has the potential to move over vast acres and the amount of damage that is then caused as a result of volatility is really just a function of the amount of material that is used. If you make multiple applications, there's going to be greater risk. If there are more acres that are sprayed, there is going to be greater risk. Folks, this right here is something an applicator, applicator can't work around this. This is something that can cause, potentially cause damage that you have no idea whether this evening, tomorrow, or the following day that there is potential for an inversion. I'm convinced we didn't have an inversion here. I think all we had right here is we had material that was coming up, we had material that was coming off, and then it moved. It moved some distance in a north direction, actually almost 300 feet, it moved in a north direction after spraying three and a half acres. How much? How, I think how far it can move and, and Larry, I, 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 think it's a I think it's a function really to come back to how much, how much area is treated and I think it has to do with the inversion. Once that inversion picks up, that inversion has potential to move before it dissipates and I've had folks, is it a mile, is it two miles, is it three miles? The answer is yes. It, it's really just a function, once it picks up and it's hung in an inversion, it's really how far that inversion is present before that material dissipates and, 
and, and then settles. Other um, other questions? Yes. Well, so what I'm saying is it can vol absolutely volat volatility is something that occurs. And you go back to the samples that Tom over a 36. We know it can volatilize continually over a 36 hour time frame. And if you take a look at this data, it would indicate it's probably volatilizing beyond that. We don't have any data beyond it. Now, Kevin is about to have some. All of my plants were pulled out at 36 hours. Tom's samples were 36 hours. So from zero to 36 hours, we can say with certainty that we have material that is being lifted up and taken back into the air. Other questions? You guys are easier than the last group. They had a lot of questions. So say that again. If there's, if there's not, not if there's not product on the plant that's volatilizing and moving and you're not getting what you can do control, what's that doing to the rotation and the activity of the plant? Yeah, so that's the question. I've had folks, I had actually someone asked me last night. So with the material and whether it's volatilizing or physical drift, someone says, well, it didn't hit where you were spraying it. And if you get it on a field and you have, well, if you have pigweed escapes, if you're getting exposure on the edge of the field, is that contributing to resistance? Or let's say you spray plants and it's volatilizing off of that plant. Is that contributing to a reduction in efficacy? I don't know if that's contributing to a reduction in, in efficacy, Sonny, out in terms of out, out in this field itself. Most of the uptake of the herbicide, and this is just herbicides in general, most herbicide uptake occurs within the first six to eight hours. Now granted, we've also got a lot of volatility that's occurring within the first six to eight, but the, also the, the other question that was asked in the other group, if you go back and you look at the literature and you look at 2,4-D, 2,4-D ester versus 2,4-D amine, generally speaking, at least with 2,4-D, as you increase the volatility of the compound, you likewise increase the efficacy of the compound. So that, co that plant, it may be volatilizing, but that plant is also breathing. You have gas exchange, you have uptake of that herbicide also within a gaseous, gaseous state. So I'm not, I'm not certain that we're, quote, seeing a reduction in efficacy because we may have some volatility associated with this. I, I don't, I, I I have no reason to think that that's the case. Yes. What if this were a sandy soil type? What, how, how, how do you think that would affect the You know, Walt, I think that um, the, that's the same question I had on. I, I honestly believe that soil type is going to have an effect. Um, I'll leave, I think a soil type will have an effect. I don't want to step out. We need to do some results where I think we actually get, I am not a fan of humid domes. I don't know if Tom made the statement, but one thing we've learned this year, there is not a correlation between humid dome data and what we see in the field. That's one thing that we have definitely learned here, but we, it would be good to understand what impact that soil texture is having. Soil texture, pH, okay. I think pH potentially of your soil. I had a soil chemist the other day, yesterday I had a soil chemist tell me that potentially the amount of salt that was in the soil could be influencing the volatility off of the soil. I don't know if that's true or not, but I had a soil chemist that told me that, that uh, they thought that was potentially possible. There's a lot that we do not know at this point, but we're learning, we've, we've learned a lot this year, I'll tell you that, with what, we, what, what you've seen out here. Yes? On the, I think it was the previous slide where you had the uh, University of Missouri data showing Flip back to it. air. Yes. Where you had the high rates of sampling and as the day moves on, it seems to have much higher rates of spinelag. Can you kind of elaborate on what you think may be causing that? I don't want to, I mean, this is Kevin's data. I, I've looked at this and I think it, and this is just purely speculation. I don't have the temperature data in front of me, but it may just be the fact that Banville is more volatile than these other materials. So for that reason, you're gassing off the Banville. Well, guess what? Once you gas it off, it's gone. So now it's the question. It's not that Ingenia and Extendamax won't gas off. 
it takes more temperature. What I'm thinking here as the day warms up, it takes more temperature to have them gas off than what it does for Banville to gas off. And for that reason, as you start getting into your afternoon temps, that's where the amount of gassing off begins to increase there. Because we didn't ga we gassed off some here, but we didn't gas off a lot. That, that would be, and that's purely, purely speculation. And the other thing is, I think folks need to also realize, when we talk about gassing off, when you take a look at herbicides that are in the air, and folks, there's herbicides in there, there's pesticides in the air, there's actually some data out of the National Geological Society that published some data that I saw. 2014, there were some air samples pulled out of, out of um, Mississippi. They pulled air samples out of Mississippi in 2014. Does anyone want to take a guess at what the herbicide was that was most commonly found in air samples in 2014? And I'll give you a hint, it's not dicamba. It's glyphosate, okay? And so that is a product that is not volatilizing, okay? That, that's not, that doesn't have volatility. That just has, as I was coming back, you spray hundreds on hundreds of thousands of acres, millions of acres, you also have the evaporation component, where those spray droplets, some of those spray droplets are evaporating. They're evaporating and they're not settling to their target. So a lot of this, a large portion of this also is a function as number of acres treated increases, and this is any product, the number of acres increase, the risk is gonna likewise increase. So I think rainfall after application, I'm going to come back to what I said the 2015. Based on what I've seen, what we know is that the, I come back to the KOC of the, the ability to bind the soil is extremely low for dicamba. So if we have rainfall after application, any measurable rainfall that I've seen, half an inch or more, you're going to drive that herbicide into the soil. It isn't tightly bound to soil, and once you do that, I believe the ability for it to volatilize, I hate, I'm not going to say the word zero, but I think it is substantially reduced once you have a rainfall event. Yeah, I saw it last year. And that's what we've seen. All of our weed control data, we see the same thing. And, and I come back to, again, the 2015 data would indicate that rainfall event, six hours after application, had a strong effect on our inability to observe volatility for some distance. Any other? Yes. It, it seems it's pretty dangerous. Do you, do you see symptoms next year of dicamba? So, so the question was, if these were seed beans, would we see symptoms? Based on the work that we've done, this was actually on a V2, V3 soybean. The likelihood of finding dicamba symptoms on the progeny of a V2, V3 drift event is extremely low. If you have dicamba on a soybean that is entering reproduct that is reproductive, R1, R2, it begins to increase. If you're in R3, R4, R5 is a worst case scenario, but R2, R3, it really begins to increase substantially and the likelihood of seeing dicamba the next year is high based on the research that I've done, that Tom Barber has done, and I'll also say the work that Lloyd Wax did in 1969. <laughs> it hasn't changed, imagine that. Okay, yes. We did not, we've done, a, the question was, do we have any yield data? And the, this is not a yield trial. We've ha we have a, we conducted 21 drift trials on this station in 2015 and 2016 for which I have yield maps and I have data. We've looked at correlations between whether it's a it's an R1 drift event, R2 drift event, R3, R4, R5, R6. One thing that we know is as you move further into reproductive development, the likelihood of symptom showing diminishes and the risk for you seeing damage from a yield loss standpoint increases. The other problem that we've encountered this year, and I, I, you'd be hard pressed to find too many fields, I believe, in this geography, at least the ones that I've been in, that have had a single application associated with them. I hate when folks ask me, we had the first group ask Tom and I, what's the yield loss on those beans? Well, I'll tell you what the yield loss. The yield loss is a function of rate for which I cannot go in and measure what rate. We've sent all these samples in the Arkansas State Plant Board, and most of the time they can't even detect dicamba, so I don't know what the rate is. 
It's very challenging for me to tell you the exact growth stage in which they, which they were hit. Chances are they were hit multiple times for which I have no idea what impact that's going to have. And then the other factor you've got to consider there is, is what are the environmental conditions? We have been very, very fortunate in this geography here for the last 10 to 14 days and the last, next 10 to 14 days looks also very fortunate. If we were in 95 degree to 100 degree temps, which we typically are at this time of year, and we did not have rainfall, we would not see, I think, the recovery of these beans as well as the recovery of the yield potential that we're seeing. I'm seeing a lot of recovery. I'm not telling you that beans are gonna fully recover, but I am seeing a lot of recovery across these fields that I've been in in the last seven to 10 days. Impact that we were talking about earlier with uh, dicamba, uh, prior to rain, etc. You, you just made a comment that with that rainfall, you're getting the product into the soil, so you're minimizing volatility. How does that relate to that residual uh, weed control that you looked at earlier? So what we, we've done a lot of work. I mean, Larry has done a lot of work also in terms of residual activity of dicamba. Does, does dicamba have residual activity? My response is. It has tremendous residual activity until it rains. And whether it's a quarter inch, whether it's a half an inch, it is one of the few herbicides, most of the herbicides we talk about a half an inch, three quarters of an inch of rainfall in order to get them activated. Dicamba seems to have activity without rainfall. Once we have rainfall, again, I'm convinced that we're moving it out of the germination zone. And at that point, we, we lose activity. That, that, that's what all the data, I've got, I've got rainfall data on that. We've done work, you've done work. There's been 15 other folks and we all have similar results. Imagine that. So, yes. You lose the activity on the weeds too. Yes, that's what we're saying. We, we, you, lose, you, lose the act, you lose the activity, you lose the activity on, on the weeds. So um, you're losing the weed control. Once you have rainfall, you begin to lose the, 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 the activity. What you also can do with rainfall, if you look at these labels though, with rainfall, because of the fact that it is highly soluble, there's some statements on the label that you, you, can't have, you can't have an application within 24 hours of a rainfall event. You can't move water from one field to another. We've had some folks that's actually moved some water from, from a field that was treated onto some susceptible fields and it does cause uh, considerable damage. Uh, we've, we've actually seen that out here in some work that we've done in the past. Well, so what I, what I, my comment on that, and again, I'm, thank goodness I've got Larry's, my, my comment on that in terms of getting 2,4-D on the field as well as getting dicamba on the field, if you have a plant that is, is up, especially let's just say a cotton or soybean that's seeded an inch and a half deep, you may be beneath you may be beneath that area, it's germinating beneath that area, you may not even have a lot of uptake at that area. Now all of a sudden you have a rainfall event that moves it down to an inch, inch and a half. I think the potential to take the herbicide up is greater there, where with a pigweed, we may be at two millimeters, a quarter of an inch, and you get a rainfall event. That pigweed is germinating where that herbicide is. You, it may be just a displacement of the herbicide on the crop versus the, versus the weed itself. It, yeah, I don't, it's, that's just, it, 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 it is going to take, and that's what folks don't realize, these herbicides here is going to take, it's not uncommon, I've seen anywhere from 10 days to 21 days before I see symptoms. I mean, there's been a times I've been in a field and I knew it had dicamba on it, had 2,4-D on it, and it took 21 days. Depending on what the environmental conditions are, it may take 21 days before you start seeing symptoms. We generally will say with most of the time with 2,4-D as well as dicamba, you need to be at least 21 days out, if not 28 to 30 days before you really start seeing maximum symptomology associated with that. If an individual comes out and you see symptoms, 
My response is back up 14 to 21 days from a foliar standpoint, and that'll give you some idea on where you are. Now, from a soil standpoint, it's slightly, slightly different than that, but from a foliar standpoint, 14 to 21 days before you're gonna start seeing symptoms. And you've gotta get that herbicide, has gotta be taken up by that plant before you're gonna start seeing symptoms. So once it's taken up, 21 days later, you should see good symptoms. Good question. Any other, I know I'm way over time and I know everyone's here to go see Jared and we've got, there's a couple of other stops. Folks, I appreciate your attention. I'm gonna bring this to a halt.